Honda has been making atmospheric engines of the K and R series for a long time and in many variants. The list of diseases has also been known for a long time. These are knocking clutches, raised camshafts, and a strange dislike of engines for conventional oils. In any case, Honda drivers are famous for their aggressive commitment to low viscosity engine fluids. And it was from their community that stories about narrow channels came. In practice, we can only note that the oil and engines of this brand does not heat up very well. This is clearly a design feature. And the company directly requires the use of high viscosity racing oils in the most forced and high speed versions. Another common feature is the very delicate engine mounts, and for 2 liter engines they are more expensive and more delicate than for 2.4 liter engines. 2.4 liter engines with a power of 190 horsepower. They usually belong to the K24Z7 series, although if the car got to us in a roundabout way, other options are possible, other modifications could be installed for regional markets. The engine has good traction and is economical, which is especially noticeable during short city trips. In principle, the K24Z7 is quite a progressive and at the same time simple engine. It has an aluminum block, cast iron liners, a 16-valve cylinder head, a timing chain drive, an IVTEC phase control system, no hydraulic compensators, and simple distributed injection. Hey buddy, looking for a used car? You should pay attention to the site Carmi.pro. Carmi.pro is huge catalog of cars, engines, gearboxes, and the best part is, you can find out about breakdowns of any part of any car absolutely free. Go on Carmi.pro and be aware of all possible malfunctions. Carmi.pro In terms of repair, the engines are well mastered and actually copy the K24Z6 version that was on the third generation CRV, and they differ from the simple K24Z1, produced since 2002, mainly in the intake and timing. Legend has it that the K24Z7 is super reliable, but that's not true at all. It has exactly the same problems that engines have had since 2002. Firstly, the exhaust camshaft simply lifts up, and the reasons are still being debated. Judging by the tests, it's all about increased valve clearances and low load bearing capacity of the oil film. This indicates that the oil is too thin. Owners unanimously say that scuffing occurs most often with viscous oils, SAE 40, for example. In theory, this is possible if the nozzles through which oil is sprayed onto the cams are of too small a diameter. In this case, lubrication will be insufficient with cold oil. But my personal experience shows that with proprietary low viscosity 0 to 20 oil, the cams lifted perfectly just in time by 120,000 mileage. Camshafts are not a cheap thing. Be prepared to pay more than 40,000 rubles for a new part. The second problem is knocking phase regulator couplings. The reasons are varied, from wear of valves and seals of the clutch and camshaft to a drop in oil pressure in the engine. With low viscosity oils, clutches knock harder and earlier. The third problem is oil consumption. Yes, this is not some kind of TSI EA888 Gen 2 from the Volkswagen concern. The consumption here is high, it's a liter per 2000 kilometers and not per 200 kilometers. Nevertheless, the problem exists. Owners of cars with mileage over 150,000 often encounter this, but those who like to snatch begin to complain about loss of oil much earlier. Some even had their motors sealed as part of the warranty. Oil leaks, weak engine mounts and floating speeds are also typical faults for engines with significant mileage. The timing resource is moderate, usually in the range of 180 to 250,000 kilometers reliable the engine rarely stops the control system stubbornly ignores minor errors and the total resource of the piston group is more than 350,000 which is not bad for such a long stroke and high-speed engine the general feeling among the owners is quite positive but costs are quite possible the 2 liter or 20a2 engine is almost a copy of the k-series in a reduced volume and there is only one camshaft although the cylinder head is 16 valve there are exactly two fewer troubles with a 20A2 than with K24. The camshaft does not wear out and the clutches do not knock. The situation with oil appetite is almost the same. 
there are chances that the engine will start to eat it up, but the unit begins to exceed the critical leader from replacement to replacement after about the first hundred thousand. And only those who like to rev the engines to the tune have consistently high consumption from the first kilometers. Diesels with a volume of 2.2 liters and a power of 150 and 180 horsepower and a volume of 1.6 liters of the N22B1-B2 and N16A4 series, 160 horsepower, which were installed on the CRV over the years, are considered moderately reliable, mainly due to not very successful fuel equipment and general capriciousness. There are complaints about early wear of the liners and the low life of the timing chain. For a 1.6 liter engine with 160 horsepower, they often complain about ruptured intake pipes and intercooler leaks on cars with high mileage. However, all this concerns operation in Europe. We have such CR Versus, they are simply a huge rarity. The CRVS brakes are quite European. At the front there are brake discs with a diameter of 293 millimeters, which is not bad for its power and weight. Rear discs are 302 millimeters. Such a solid diameter is here because the parking brake is made in the old-fashioned way, with a drum mechanism inside the main disc. Everything is done as simply as possible and works flawlessly, single piston calipers front and rear with a floating caliper, standard handbrake drive, but there are still a couple of weak points. Firstly, the caliper finger seals do not like the use of any lubricant, they swell greatly and jam. Make sure that no lubricants are used during servicing. Thoughtlessly flooding the entire mechanism with copperhead is especially dangerous. Hey buddy, looking for a used car? You should pay attention to the site Carmi.pro. Carmi.pro is huge catalog of cars, engines, gearboxes, and the best part is you can find out about breakdowns of any part of any car absolutely free. Go on Carmi.pro and be aware of all possible malfunctions. Carmi.pro and sometimes ABS fails. Failures occur mainly due to the system's power supply, a fuse oxidizes, or a connector latch fails. Sensors that are poorly protected are less likely to fail, which is why they are relatively easy to damage when going off-road. Blocks are sometimes reflashed, and after that everything does not always work stably. Even very reliable cars have their weak points. The suspension is exactly the CRVS Achilles heel, the front suspension runs for a very reasonable hundred plus thousand, but many who bought the car knew have encountered repairs to the rear. The suspension died at mileage of 30 to 60 thousand, in mass and without any reasonable explanation. Despite the fact that the main parts of the rear suspension can last up to 200 thousand mileage, many little things fail much earlier. These include weak trailing arm bushings, weak small wishbones, and weak shock absorber mounts. If you're unlucky after those same 30 to 60,000 on a new car. Well, with non-original spare parts, such frequency of maintenance does not cause much surprise. Let's also remember about a dozen silent blocks and fasteners that require replacement. At a minimum, you'll have to install new alignment bolts. It's better to count on replacing all the fasteners. And, alas, this is a relatively expensive repair, even when using non-original parts. It's good at least that shock absorbers lose efficiency at mileages only well beyond 150,000 and leak at runs over 200. In the front suspension, the bushings and stabilizer links are heavily loaded and do not last long. With runs of only 100,000, breakdowns of the ears of the front stabilizer are noted. Stabilizer struts are replaced more often on European cars, here it is noticeably thicker, 23 millimeters versus 20 millimeters for the American version. Accordingly, the loads are higher. A common problem is that the original studs regularly break off when tightened. The front shock absorbers often no longer hold up after a hundred thousand, and even the supports require attention, the bearing periodically begins to creak. The rear silent block of the front control arm holds well, but only if the springs do not sag, and this happens. Fortunately, both silent blocks are replaceable, as is the ball joint, so repairs are relatively inexpensive. A simple rack with an electric power steering system has proven to be very capricious in this generation. It's all about the weak mechanical part. 
If water has not gotten inside, then, as a rule, replacing the side bushings and the thrust block helps. But there are also many cases when you need to polish the stem and repair the body. Usually, repair side bushings are installed first, since this does not require removing the rack from the car. The chances of encountering this are almost 100%, and the time before repair depends only on the mileage and maintenance. Often the service center replaces the bushings in advance, just when the rods and ends are replaced again. But whether the rack will need to be seriously repaired depends on how the owner takes care of the car. In most cases, serious problems are caused by water ingress and dry grease, torn boots, and poorly tightened clamps. CV joints are not particularly reliable. The front ones are often replaced at the turn of hundreds of thousands, especially in European versions. At 200,000, the drive shaft will almost certainly please with vibrations. In this case, the cross pieces and the suspension bearing are replaced. Moreover, the suspended one here is made in Korea and fails before cracks appear at the support. The repair price is in the range of 10 to 30,000 rubles, depending on the greed of the service. The boxes apparently do not break because there is not a single mention of anything happening to the mechanics. This is indirectly proven by the wide selection of manual transmissions at ridiculous prices at disassembly sites. The flywheel is simple, one piece, the clutch is simple, with a damper disc, the hydraulic drive is if you change the oil on time and don't run into a fake external main filter, which is a problem, but install a high quality filter with a bracket for the automatic transmission, then the box will live almost forever. Due to its design, it is very strong. The main complaint against it is the moderate service life of the torque converter locking linings, which often does not exceed 200,000 mileage. Another typical story is twitching at low power in third gear. This occurs due to slipping of the corresponding clutch in low pressure modes. The cause of slipping, as a rule, lies in dirty oil and wear of the linear pressure solenoids and controls. It is worth changing the oil and updating the software, which does not allow a critical drop in oil pressure in this mode. It's even better to change the set of third gear clutches, especially if you don't know how long the box was tormented with dirty oil. There are chances of other breakdowns, but they are small, and usually the symptoms look like this. The transmission hangs in gear, stubbornly not shifting. This almost certainly points to the valve body. Dirty oil finishes it off first. Failure of one of the seven solenoids is a relatively rare occurrence, which suggests that the cause is either contamination or overheating of the unit. The three solenoids are located outside and are easy to diagnose and clean. Oddly enough, Contrary to modern standards, they are collapsible. Bearing failures or general wear of friction pairs are rare. The angular gearbox sometimes fails, its bearings die. The situation is rare, but dangerous. The gearbox has a common oil bath with the automatic transmission box, and accordingly, it supplies wear products to the automatic transmission. So, in addition to monitoring backlash, you can check the condition of the external filter when changing the oil. If there are chips in it, then in addition to the automatic transmission, you also need to check the bevel gear. The rear axle drive clutch is located on the rear axle gearbox. The design has undergone significant changes compared to earlier versions of Honda. The clutch uses a pair of mechanical and electric pumps, much like in the first Haldux. An overloaded electric pump and a simplified design have led to the system not working very well. Overheating of the clutch when the front axle slips is common. The driver has 5 to 10 minutes to get out. The conditions of Russian exploitation also have an impact. Quite often the drive relay, 39794 SDA A05, and the rear fuse box in the trunk fails. And with rear oil changes, the solenoid in the gearbox itself gets stuck. The pump dies less often. The most unpleasant thing is that the clutch has a bad habit of remaining in partial locking mode, which quickly finishes off the drive shaft and the clutches of the clutch itself. To prevent this from happening, at the slightest suspicion of a stuck solenoid, you need to de-energize the clutch and wait for the pressure in the hydraulics to drop. It's worth looking for signs of corrosion on the outside, but almost all that can be seen at first glance are small random chips or sandblast marks on the leading edge of the hood or roof. 
You can also find real rust on the side and rear doors. Below, near the drain holes, even in fairly new cars, traces of corrosion are visible on the internal seam on the side doors. On top, on the frame, corrosion is hidden under the seal. It is enough to bend it over the rear view mirrors on the front doors and at the rear of the frame on the rear ones, the weld will rot. This is a very unpleasant problem that will appear en masse on the CRV in the coming years. The problem occurs in both American and European cars. It appears on most specimens, but not on all. The rear door has chips and rust both in the area of the hood and under the lower edge seal, especially on cars from Moscow and St. Petersburg. If you approach the inspection very carefully, you will find abrasions under the side door moldings near the glass. You can often notice small bubbles there evidence that the car was poorly washed and the paint was rubbed off. Similar spots near the roof rail fastenings also appear if the roof has not been washed properly. All other potentially problematic areas are covered with plastic and without serious disassembly of the body, problems that have begun cannot be noticed. They will be visible only if the problem is long-standing and neglected. Bodywork with the removal of plastic and, of course, the consequences of an accident greatly contribute to the manifestation of problems. The key to good condition for a CRV is factory, very high-quality assembly, and timely anti-corrosive treatment of arches and internal cavities. The bottom view may upset most fans of the brand. Even cars of recent years of production have many areas underneath where individual pockets of minor corrosion have already merged into a continuous layer of rust. This includes the area where the trailing arm is attached to the body, especially on the left, where the fuel tank is located, and the rear part of the rear wheel arches where it meets the spar, and the spar itself at the mounting points of the rear subframe. There are traces of rust on the towing eye reinforcements on the spare wheel well. For cars from the northern regions, the underside of the threshold from below also rusts intensively. There are many small spots on brackets, on edges protruding downwards, and similar elements. The underbody panels are raised high enough, so the body floors still show little corrosion. Corrosion on the seams of the front panel and unpleasant rust spots under the sealant on the seams of the front suspension pillars indicate that the body is a little weak for an SUV and lacks rigidity. The interior is almost always dry, fortunately the floors are high, the quality of the seals is good, and the drains are well made. The drains in the engine recess sometimes get clogged, but this is typical mainly for cars that are parked under trees. The engine compartment is clean, the boots are very good. Debris accumulates intensively in the cavities under the rear lights, over time, this can lead to the formation of a corrosion pocket, but so far no problems have been noted, only the wiring suffers. In general, the car looks a little better than most Japanese classmates of the same age due to better detailing of the edges of the arches and plastic doors and the absence of dirt pockets. The fastening of the lockers is successful, it is remote, which allows the metal to dry quickly. But the paint inside the arches is weak and the lockers are very narrow and actually only cover the inner arch seam and the edges of the inner rear wheel arch are corroded on both sides. It's a miracle that cars don't have rust through them. On the other hand, European cars in most cases have more developed rear arch lockers and better galvanized metal. It's a pity that not all CRV owners do anti-corrosion treatment of the body in advance without waiting for holes to appear in the bottom. As befits a good Japanese car, there's not much to worry about here. These are, in particular, flying off headlight washer plugs, easily sandblasted optics and windshield, which also cracks from any sneeze or in cold weather, massively peeling chrome and delicate mirror brackets that are afraid of both reagents and mechanical damage. In dusty regions, the rear door seals squeak. The rain sensor is capricious, and the mirror adjustment mechanism turns sour after five years of use. The cylinder at the ignition switch is easily killed, it begins to play and sometimes jams. Otherwise, the CRV is almost perfect, and even these breakdowns are typical mainly for models with mileage well over 100,000 or more than 10 years. Late CR Versus can still boast that the breakdown column for a careful and not very picky owner will be empty. The car's bumpers are strong and well secured. 
The vulnerable spots are made of unpainted plastic. The fastening will not allow it to be pulled up on curbs. The locks and handles work great. The only complaints are about the rear door lock drive. Very durable window regulators are almost always caused by weak wiring or control unit contacts and not by the mechanism itself. This is usually due to flooding or operation at extremely low temperatures. The lower moldings are not attached particularly securely, but dirt does not accumulate under them. It seems that these are all breakdowns that many people have a chance of encountering. Some special ones are more likely from the realm of fantasy or the result of very careless handling. The interior is very different between American and British cars in terms of ergonomics and overall feeling of quality, but in terms of wear resistance, the difference is not so great. In most cases, the mileage is revealed only by the shine of the steering wheel, abrasions on the gear lever lining, and the driver's armrest. For those who like to throw their phone and keys onto the front panel, the pad under the multimedia system screen suffers. There are also scratched passenger panel linings and torn armrests, but this is due to the characteristics of use. Sometimes you come across English cars with peeling climate control buttons, they have a soft touch coating. But American cars have basically nothing to peel off. A fabric interior stores mileage information more reliably than a leather interior. And if the owner is careful, then with a mileage of 300,000, you may not guess how much the car has actually traveled. The climate control system is quite reliable, except for rare breakdowns of the control unit buttons. The failure is mainly caused by a dirty heat exchanger. Because of it, the driver's side is much warmer in summer than the passenger side, although usually the temperature distribution needs to be reversed. The electrical part is perfect. If anything breaks, it's the corrugations of the door wiring, and occasionally there are failures of the buttons and wiper motor. However, there are spots on the sun, and the CRVS battery charge voltage regulation system tends to leave owners without a car in winter. AMS, alternator management system, keeps the voltage in the onboard network at 12.2V when the headlights are off, almost without charging the battery. The voltage jumps when the engine brakes, the battery voltage drops below 11.8 V, or when powerful consumers like heaters or headlights are turned on. As a result, when the DRLs are working in winter, the chances of draining the battery are maximum. The current sensor on the battery fails, and the system allows a deep discharge already in the second or third year of operation. As a result, they try to disable the system either by deceiving the sensor or by interfering with the brains. Otherwise, you will have to change the battery more often.